or so if so if one of the um priests could lead us in prayer that would be great yeah. in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our passes as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was the beginning, is now, and it shall be but with the ten. Amen. We'll now pray our weekly prayer, prayer to end abortions. Lord God, I thank you today for the gift of my life and for the lives of all my brothers and sisters. I know there is nothing that destroys more life than abortion. Yet I rejoice that you have conquered death by the resurrection of your son. I am ready to do my part in ending abortion. Today I commit myself never to be silent, never to be passive, never to be forgetful of the unborn. I commit myself to be active in the pro-life movement and never to stop defending life until all my brothers and sisters are protected and our nation once again become a nation with liberty and justice, not just for some, but for all. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So um, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, for today um, Dr. Linda Curry. She is the director of the Institute for Pastoral Leadership and a professor of pastoral theology at the University of St. Mary of the Lake Mundo Line Seminary. She is a psychologist and a licensed clinical social worker. She used to be a pro-choicer who volunteered and worked for Planned Parenthood, one of the largest abortion providers in our nation. Later, she had a profound conversion and turned to the Catholic Church. Now she is an ardent pro-lifer and a sought-after speaker sharing her testimony and conversion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Curry. All right. Hello, everybody. It's nice Hello. to meet you meet you over Zoom. I wish we were in person. It's always so much nicer. But I do really want to let you know that although we're on Zoom, um, I think one of the most important times, part of our time together today is going to be the Q&A. So what I'm going to plan on doing is I'll talk for about mm, maybe 35 minutes, and then we'll use the rest of our time to to talk together about these really important things. And as you'll know from my story, I've had a lot of experience. So sometimes I'm a good person to tap into and you'll realize I'm not very shy about anything. So open your hearts and see if the Holy Spirit prompts any questions because I'm here to answer them. So I like to start off by um, talking about how I grew up a little bit. So I was brought up in a lukewarm Catholic family we went to mass, I received my sacraments, etc. But I don't know, I, I didn't really pray very much. And I got into high school. And I really just dropped the God thing altogether. Um, and then I went to college, and I dropped it even more. So in college, I, I met my first boyfriend, and he was an atheist. And that seemed interesting to me. So I became an atheist. And then after a while, I, I thought that being an atheist was also rather absurd. And so I kind of settled into this agnostic coat, if you will. Didn't know if God existed or didn't exist, but I wasn't going to worry too much about it. And I think that that's a very kind of familiar religion coat to a lot of people now. They're like, I don't know or it's the spiritual but not religious type of thing. I, I kind of fit into that camp, although I wasn't even very spiritual. I was much more, I don't know. I mean, I would like read Nietzsche and smoke cigarettes and drink coffee and be really smart about things or think I was really smart about things. So that's in my 20s when I was very agnostic. And, and that time in my life, I won't get too into but it's filled with rife and adventure. But what, what I want you to pay a cl you know, close attention to is my thinking process. So 
I have to say, if I were to look at my values back then, I valued freedom above everything else. It was like the whole idea of freedom and liberty was the supreme value to me. I really like the prayer that you did that you seem to do every week, your your pro-life prayer and saying that this be a nation that's liberty for all, right? So in my mind, I, it's very important for us to think about what do we mean by freedom? But at the time, freedom was everything to me, um, personally and politically, it was a number one. And therefore, in my mind, I viewed religion as being oppressive and cruel. I, I didn't agree with anybody on that side of the fence. As far as I was concerned, they seemed judgmental, they seemed boring, they seemed anti-intellectual, and I didn't want to be like them at all. So I wouldn't even consider their ideas as an option. So in my mind, religious people weren't engaged in what I saw as the real world. They were in some sort of weird fantasy world. So I like to first begin by saying that. And then I like to follow up with this other distinction about me. And what I'm about to say, it's, it's actually quite technical, but I'm gonna try to give it, I, I wrote a whole dissertation on, on this. So I'm gonna give it to you in like three sentences because I, I think it's relevant. When I look at different temperament types, I would always say that I had a quote, liberal temperament. Now, what I mean by that, it's not politics, it's not how I voted, but Jonathan Haidt does a lot of work in this. And in, in, in the quickest way to put it would be, I tend to prefer compassion to standards. Now that doesn't mean that people with a more conservative temperament aren't compassionate. Um, what it indicates is that kind of my go-to thing the first place I go to is being compassionate to people, being nice to people, being good to people. So this liberal temperament that I had was how I kind of gauged myself. I was idealistic, motivated, politically minded. All of my friends were like this. We had big hearts. And being pro-choice was a big part of that thinking. So I, I think that's part of our, our time together is where did that essentially good thinking steer me wrong? I mean, it's good to be compassionate. It's good to meet people where they're at. It's good to accompany people. It's good to not be judgmental and to, you know, once again, to meet people where they're at and to try to help them. But I think it's a good thing to ask, like, where does that good impulse steer people wrong as I was? So maybe some of you have read Abby Johnson's book, Unplanned. I'm a lot, my story is a lot like her. She also worked at Planned Parenthood. But in short, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I was working at a mental health center, a rural mental health center. And I noticed that a lot of the problems, I, I worked with a lot of teenagers. I loved working with teenagers. And I noticed that a lot of their problems or a lot of their issues revolved around issues of sexuality. And um, I really liked and believed in the work of Planned Parenthood. I believed that they were teaching parents how to talk to their kids about sex. I was a firm believer in contraception. I was a firm believer in um, well, let's just say um, I saw any kind of chastity training as being ridiculous in my mind. I'm different now. Sorry. This is who I was just being like, I've got a whole different way of thinking now. But I really, really believe this. I believed so much in this mission that I took a pay cut to go and work for Planned Parenthood. I'd been volunteering with them for years. And I wonder... I wonder about this sometimes um, because I made a sacrifice to go work there because I thought it was so important. And obviously while I was there, 
I all you know the, the the particular Planned Parenthood I worked at, I was in education there. I was wasn't in charge of anything that had to do with the abortion clinic per se, but I was a licensed clinical social worker. So sometimes I would be called down to do counseling, and I did a lot of work with um, assisting in the abortion room because. I really cared about and really loved the women and I knew what they were going through was difficult and I wanted to be there with them and help them through it. So before I start talking a little bit more about my time at Planned Parenthood, I think it would be remiss or even potentially dishonest for me to not tell you everything about my story, which is that when I was 24 years old, I myself had an abortion. So my circumstances were very typical for a girl living my lifestyle. Um, I had a boyfriend. He was my new boyfriend. I got pregnant. I didn't want to be pregnant. But I think I was starting grad school but I decided I was going to have the baby, not because I was pro-life and not because I had any intention of marrying this man I was dating, but because I figured it was my responsibility, right? It was my responsibility. I was pregnant. And no matter how incredibly pro-choice I was, I, I never played the game that it wasn't a baby. That just seemed absurd to me. I'm like, yes, it's a baby. And yes, we're killing babies. And yes, that, that's a horrible thing. I wish we didn't have to, but it's a necessary sacrifice for freedom. But in my circumstances, I, I figured I was responsible for this happening. I mean, I was using birth control. It just didn't work. And my circumstances would have supported me having a child in that it was going to be incredibly inconvenient. My parents wouldn't have disowned me. The, the particular people, that, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a scandal, right? It wasn't, wouldn't have been the scandal. My parents would have been annoyed, but they, they definitely wouldn't have disowned me or anything. And I could have figured my way around it. But either way, I was so stressed out i i um an un, an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy it was absolutely frightening i mean i was it was like i was stressed out from from the top of my head to the to the very tips of my toes like i couldn't sleep i was like shaking and i was like in going to i was going to do it i was going to do it i was going to um have this have this child and my, and my boyfriend, he was supportive. He said, you know, whatever your decision is, I, I support it, which I think he's trying to be as good as he could be. But sometimes, too, it's like it was all up to me, right? He didn't weigh in at all. But he was he, he was on board if, 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 I, if I decided to have the child. So I was waiting tables at the time, and so stressed out not sleeping and i remember exactly where i was standing in the restaurant it was at the end of the night and this thought came into my head and it was you can you can have an abortion and to be completely honest in that moment i felt all the all the stress leave my body and it felt really good. And I felt like I could breathe for the first time in five weeks. And it felt so good that it, it verged on, on feeling right. And then another kind of voice or notion came to my head, which was, well, what about the baby? And I just went and pushed away the thought, right? I mean, it's kind of like how sin works, right? Like the 
the subjective convenience and relief of all of it made me overlook everything else. And so I ran to my friend's house and I said, I can, I can have an abortion. And she said, yeah, you can. And, and I'll be here for you. And, and I did, I had an abortion a couple of weeks later. And here's the thing is after my abortion, I was fine. And I remained fine for a very long time. But I believe that being pro-choice made it easier to keep the abortion at bay. Because you have a lot of people surrounding you saying, it's okay, it's okay. Not only is it okay, it's good. And you're being a good woman by doing this. And you're you're not hurting anybody. You're protecting women. And there, there's this whole crowd of people that help you keep this thing that you've done, which is killing your child at bay. And and so I want you to to keep in mind that the the, the pro the pro choice movement is fueled by women who have had abortions. And yeah, it's it's a way of keeping things at bay, and it does help. I think. So I'm walking around and I'm fine. And I'm working at Planned Parenthood, which I believe proved just how fine I was. So when I became a bona fide employee of Planned Parenthood, which I only was for a short amount of time, I think I was there maybe a year and a half as a bona fide employee, but I'd been volunteering for years and was just a part of that whole culture. So I find this time in my life to be really interesting when I was working there. So it's this is after I had had my abortion, quite a bit after actually, years after I had my abortion. And because I was a licensed clinical social worker, sometimes I would be called in to do counseling. If, if one of the counselors wasn't there and there was there was a girl that I was downstairs with and she had just found out she was pregnant she was 16 and, and she was so stressed out of her mind completely freaked out as you would be when you're 16 and you just realize that you're pregnant and she was sitting in the room with me and, and I went through her her options in which it's, you can go through with the pregnancy and you can give the baby up for adoption. And that's it's gonna be hard, but we're here to help you with it. Cause we, we did, we, we help people through that. Um, you can also go through with the pregnancy and keep the child, which we also help people with. Or, or you can have an abortion. And I remember her eyes looking at me and she was just like looking at me so intently. And she said, just t tell me one thing. If I, um, if I have an uh, abortion, am I killing my baby? And I was really stressed out by that question. Because in my heart, like, or even in my mind, I thought it was killing a baby, but I didn't feel like I could say like, yes, you're going to be killing your baby. So I said, you will be terminating the product of your conception. And she looked confused. And then she scheduled an abortion. And I was so incredibly stressed out by this. I have a, you know, a professional code of ethics that I take really seriously, which is you never deceive your client. And plus I'm a, I'm a moral person and I didn't know what to do with this. So I, I went up to my supervisor and I said, I, I need to talk to you because 
this girl just asked me if she's killing her baby and I think she is killing her baby, but it seems really harsh to say, yeah, you're killing your baby and let's sign you up for an abortion. And I'm like, I just don't know what to do. I, I feel like I was doing verbal gymnastics with her to, to trick her. And my supervisor was a really reasonable person. And she's like, I know it might seem like that, but imagine if she had the baby and what she'd be going through and she's going to be okay. And abortion needs to be legal and like then we had the whole conversation with each other where we kind of psych each other up and we're like okay we're doing the right thing but I had this dissonance in my head it was just this <laughs> which you can ignore for a long time right so another thing that happened while I was there is there was a nurse that I was friends with and she'd been in the abortion industry for 20 years, been a nurse there, but she was honestly one of the most compassionate, kind people I've mm -hmm. known. And she came to my office and she said, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. And she, she shut the door and she's like, I don't know why this is bothering me, Linda. She's like, I've, I've been through this so many times, but I, 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 I can't get, I, it's really bothering me because I just, I just saw a little hand um, from an abortion that had just happened. And she's like, are we doing the right thing? I'm like, we are. And there we were, you know, two grossly underpaid women giving our lives to this mission, sitting knee to knee, crying, and telling each other, we're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing. And she shut the door. And it was still that, that dissonance in my head. But it's like, carry on, you know? Carry on. Doing the good work. And at the time, I, I was living in Champaign-Urbana, which is where the University of Illinois is here. And... I was going to go get my doctoral degree. So I was really tied into U of I and that kind of academic community. And I was trying to think if I were to be getting a doctoral degree, what would I do my research in? And I noticed down in the abortion clinic, which mind you, this is also interesting. The abortion clinic during the week was a prenatal clinic where we would take care of the the really poor people in town because the, the Catholic hospital wouldn't take Medicaid at the time. So we took all the poor pregnant girls and took care of them at Planned Parenthood. And that, that was true. And that made me really hate the Catholic church. I'm like, what's the deal? You won't even take Medicaid? So during the week, it would be a clinic and we would have pictures of babies up. And then on the weekend, we'd take down the pictures of the babies and put up like landscape pictures. And then it would be an abortion clinic. So inside of the clinic, you have this, we had this area where girls and women would sit after their abortion just to kind of rest and have orange juice and get their strength back. And somebody at some point there had had the idea that it would be a good, it would be a good idea to have journals there for them to write in afterwards for therapeutic reasons, possibly. And I'd realized that nobody had ever replaced the journal. So there was like 10 of them back there. So I went and I... I want to turn off Sona's Father Joseph can you turn off oh there you go thank you um so we you know nobody had replaced the journals so I thought to myself well this is going to be some good untainted qualitative research what what do what are women going through in these moments after they have an abortion I'm like this will be good information so I went down and with my Diet Coke and started looking through the journals. And and I, I have to tell you, I was 
I was totally shocked because I mean, there were some entries that were like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy. I'm so relieved. Everybody's been so kind. And then, but there are other entries that said, oh my God, what have I done? I've killed my baby, exclamation point, exclamation point. I mean, very stressed out, upset expressions of how they were feeling. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I really couldn't. I, this is not what I expected at all because mind you, I had had an abortion and I was fine, right? And I felt completely compelled. Like what is happening to these women? Are they getting any help after this? So I went to the director and I said, this is a problem. And she said, well, you're the one with all the connections at U of I. Why don't you go set up, do some research, set up a post-abortive group, get an intern. And I did all of that and learned about post-abortive care. But it's really hard to get people to come back. What are you going to do? Write them a letter? Are they going to really want to come back there? I mean, how do you even address this? So it was a great idea, but it didn't really oh work. Yeah. So none of none of these things ended up working. And I stayed there for a while. And then within my own world, and I do a whole talk on this, but it's it's not the space to do it right now. But you know, you hear it said, you take one step toward God and he just comes barreling at you. You know, he just comes running toward you. And that's what happened with me. I I really, I really was just looking out the window thinking that I loved my life and everything was going so well. And I was going to go get my doctoral degree. It was everything I wanted. And then I was like, oh, I haven't really dealt with this issue of God in a while, these existential issues, maybe I should start thinking about them. And yeah, so anyway, <laughs> that put me back on the path to considering and being curious about Catholicism, which as you can imagine is, it's not um, a very comfortable thing to have a conversion or a reversion to Catholicism whilst working at Planned Parenthood. It was awkward, um, but it was, it was interesting. So what I want you to take from what I'm saying is that in a lot of ways, when people think about Planned Parenthood and abortion and the abortion industry, because it's such an ugly thing. I mean, what can be uglier than killing babies? I, I think that's as bad as it gets, right? And it, it's hard to imagine who are these people and how can they do this? And I offer you myself because I did. And it was wrong, it always was wrong. I'm not here to justify myself at all. But but where did, where did this thinking start to, to bring me wrong, right? I mean, there's so many people in our country that are are part of this. You know, the devil, the way he works is he, he doesn't get you to believe an outright lie. He just kind of slants things in his direction slowly, right? So what of this? What of this whole pro-choice mindset. I mean, as a small, small caveat to my story um, is the fact that at one point, much like when I was in the restaurant and this notion came to me, I, I could have an abortion. I, I was standing in my mother's kitchen. It was 11 years later after my abortion. And it suddenly hit me. I, I, I've had an abortion. And I, I, I complete, I had a panic attack. I completely, I mean, of course I knew I did, but I didn't really absorb it. And like, right in that moment, it struck me like I did this and it was horrible. I mean, there's, there's no, I don't know. 
maybe you do know, or maybe you do know people who have been through this psychological hell, but when you know that you're responsible for the death of your own child, your own hands, I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's, it's only the, the forgiveness of Christ that can pull you through that, right? So it was, it was, it was that's a journey in and of itself. I, I do a whole talk on that as well. But in summary, I went through Project Rachel and I went through um, some work with some priests and found myself forgiven. And I'd say that, I mean, it's sort of one of those things I'm, I'm healed, but it's something I carry with me all the time. Um, and that's all right. It's, it's my cross to bear. But what I want to let you know is that I'm not a totally different person now than I was back then when I was pro-choice. I'm not. I'm the same person, a generous person who's trying. Um, but, I mean, some things are, of course, completely different, like the fact that I know that and admit that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. <laughs> and that way it makes everything different. But I'm still the same Linda. I'm still the same Linda. So at the base of the pro-choice mindset, well, there's a lot of things now. And I, I've, I've also watched, and this is why I look forward to us talking, because I think things have has e have even changed and morphed in the last in the last 10 years but abortion you know this whole idea that abortion helps women it doesn't hurt women i mean that's just not true whether or not you know some women go through their whole lives and they never they never come around to any sort of traumatic response to their abortion that's true um but in general it it hurts women I mean, just our, our whole culture, the whole contraceptive culture and the idea that women's bodies are so disposable and how I, I, I've been developing a lot of thoughts on on feminism and just the, the problems with um, our ideas of, of freedom and autonomy and the body and how many problems come forth from this total misunderstanding of the connection of body and soul and one of those things that a woman's body does a healthy woman's body does is a healthy woman's body gets pregnant and oral contraception takes a healthy body and makes it malfunction so there's a lot of problems with contraception and it certainly hasn't decreased abortion but nonetheless, there's a lot of really false ideas out there. And, and I have to say that the Catholic Church has all the right ideas. They're inconvenient. A lot of the Catholic ideas are, are inconvenient, especially in this culture, but they're right. And they're the right things for women. So how do, how do we begin to be pro-life in a culture, in a, in a contraceptive culture, in a culture that um, sees sex the way that it does, that that sees sex as as being, it's just procreation is taken out of it. You know, it's it's almost like pregnancy is sex gone wrong instead of sex gone right. <laughs> you know, that's like the whole point. I mean, there's love and there's union and and there's pleasure. You know, God God wills those things as well. So it's not easy. It's I understand it's not easy to be pro-life in a culture that's turned itself so steadily in the wrong direction. And, and we're, we're more entrenched in it now than than ever. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to let you know that one of the one of the really hard things for me was. In becoming pro-life, which, which took a long time. I mean, I didn't turn on a dime at all. And a, a lot of the reason why I was able to, I mean, I started coming back to the church, but I figured I could be like a pro-choice Catholic, or I figured I could be a contraceptive Catholic. I mean, they are out there, right? For sure. 
certainly there's lots of contracepting Catholics. Um, but I, I just thought, you know, I can, I can manage my way. So I, I was Catholic back in the church as, and, and was pro-choice in my mind. I didn't know how to work it out. I didn't know how to work it out. And I also didn't have any, like zero Christian friends, none, zero. I knew zero Christian, like I had to start my, I mean, I had nobody, but I did have a really great priest who I started talking to, who kind of just met me where I was at. I mean, he knew I was pro-choice and he's like, and I'm like, don't talk to me about that yet because I really want any excuse to not be Catholic because it's going to really stink up my life to be Catholic. <laughs> you know, like this is not going to be fun for me. So we can't go to the um, the me becoming pro-life place yet. And he was patient with me and he stayed my friend and it seemed like he liked me. And most importantly, I wasn't an object of conversion, right? He wasn't like, oh, this is fresh meat. It's a Planned Parenthood girl and I can convert her, you know? But I, I did end up obviously becoming life but I'm just letting you know that I mean it, it took a long time and in a lot of ways I didn't want to because admitting that I was pro-life meant that a lot of people that I really respected and really loved wouldn't respect me anymore it's not and also academia you think that's an easy place to be and be pro-life it's not it's just not so I had to give up a lot which which is great I'm glad I did it but it's another thing to keep in mind that it's not a small thing to ask somebody to move from being pro-choice to pro-life because most people are going to see you as being, get this, yeah, anti-intellectual, shallow, not in the real world. I mean, I know what it's like to judge those people. I mean, that seems like good justice on God's part. Now I'm that person, right? I mean, he's like that and that's fine, but it wasn't easy. And I needed a lot of support to do it. So with that, I like to kind of wrap things up. It's a lot of information. I could go down many, many, many rabbit holes, all the places that I've thought into this and all the ways that it intersects with all the things that I'm interested in. But I'd really rather spend a little bit of time talking with you. And as I end, I just, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being interested enough on a Saturday night, whatever time it is, wherever you're at, that we get to spend this time together for stuff that actually really matters and a fight that's hard to fight. And um, I don't know. Thank you for being here and thank you for being pro-life and thank you for putting in the hard work to do it. So with that, I'll end and we can start chatting. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and begin our Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and unmute and ask. I have a question. Um, thank you for sharing your story. And I really liked how you pointed out how it's hard in academia. Um, my background is in bioethics. So I definitely know that's a field where there's also it's challenging to have those conversations. Um, but a question I have is, um, based on your geography, having those conversation looks a lot different. Um, I think mm. currently, I'm originally from the Midwest, but currently I live in the South and I know having these conversations is a lot easier. Oh, but, wow. Yeah, but if I was like in the West Coast or the East Coast or the Midwest, it's a lot harder. So how do you engage in those conversations when... I guess the crowd that you're catering to is less susceptible to listen. Yeah, I think it everything's contextual. So certainly it's not the first thing I'm bringing up in mixed company, right? Um, but let's just say it were to somehow come up or somebody said, oh my gosh, it's so weird. You're pro-life. Like, you know, if it came up, I think the first thing is, is to hold a ton of humility and just to say, yes, I am. And it's, it's been a long road. Um, and I've firmly landed here 
and I am absolutely pro-life, mostly just because I, I can't say that it's not taking of a human life. That just seems silly to me. And, I'm, and I always say, I'm like, it's inconvenient to be pro-life. I don't like it because I don't like the difficulties of an unwanted pregnancy and the burden that that puts on women. And so it's not easy to be pro-life, but I can't talk myself out of the fact that it's a baby. And I guess I'm just as honest as I can be. And that's the best that I can do. I mean, I never know if I've convinced anybody in the midst of that. I know most of the time, and I don't like this, but people walk away thinking I'm stupid or maybe thinking I don't like women or maybe thinking I'm backwards. But I usually just say it in the most humble, sincere way, knowing that there's no way in that environment I'm going to convert anybody. But if they know that I've struggled with it and that I'm not casual about it, I'm not like, it's a baby. And then I'll, you know, like a, as if I'm not acknowledging the difficulty that it is on people that are in unwanted pregnancies. So that's about the best that I have, but there's, there's suffering and humiliation that comes with it. But I think that if somebody would have done that in front of me, it would have at least made me think harder. Right. So thanks for asking that. I wish I had the right answer, but that's what I do. So when I initially heard um, uh, your sharing, when I was a deacon, yeah, I, when I was a deacon at Mandalay, I still remember you mentioning about the forgiveness part of this. Oh, uh, right, yeah. So if you can just talk about, you know, forgiving yourself and, you know, um, uh, because that was one part where I, I usually don't cry during my class session, but I remember I was really moved. At that moment, can you talk about the forgiveness um, element, definitely from your personal life, but also uh, in general about about that conversion happened and how forgiveness um, was a important element of this? Can you can you just shed some light on that? Yeah. Well, thanks for being touched by that, Father, because I, I when I talk about it, I'm I really give myself, you know. So a couple things about forgiveness, like I said, um, knowing that you have killed your child, right? I mean, if you're not going to mince words about it, is um, it's untenable. Like, there's no way of actually dealing with it. So one thing that really strikes me, you know, there's this whole idea of forgiving yourself. Well, how do you forgive yourself for something like what what is forgiveness you know in in a weird way i don't want to let myself off the hook right i, I don't want to forgive myself and let myself off the hook like and, and sometimes like that's what that's what we think forgiveness is and we'll be like oh well it's understandable you know you were in a bad situation i've even had some people be like well it's okay because so much good has come out of it and i'm like no it's, it's not okay it's never okay it's not okay. So a couple things about forgiveness is when you're feeling what, whatever it is, whether it be something, an abortion or, 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 or anything that plagues your, your conscience, thing about confession and the sacraments is, is I, I, I would confess this sin and I'd wait for a feeling of forgiveness. But here's the thing, like, forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a, it's a fact. The fact is, when I confessed it sincerely, with all my heart, it was forgiven. That's what God does. 
I mean, that, that's who he is. And it's a drop in the ocean. I, I recently was listening to somebody in deliverance ministry was an exorcist. And he said that any sin that's confessed can like it, it can never be brought up because it's literally gone. So I think he was referencing if there were, if there were demons or something that, that call out your sins as, as the exorcist. And it struck me that it's like, they're gone. Like it is forgiven. Jesus has forgiven me. So the thing about forgiving myself I, I, I tell this story because it's true, which is when I got engaged to the man I'm now married to. I, he's like super, like, he's like Mr. Catholic. He's like so Catholic. He's, uh, he's wonderful. He reads first things like page to page. He's like that kind of guy. Anyway, and, uh, he knew I worked at Planned Parenthood. He knew my story. I just, I hadn't, I hadn't told him I had had an abortion and I wasn't worried about telling him this is when we were engaged. I wasn't like, oh, he's going to judge me or anything. I wasn't that worried about it, but I'm like, well, he needs to know. So it was, it was interesting because I, when I went to, I went to his apartment and, and I told him, and then I don't know, sometimes I surprised myself. I found myself crying and then I found myself like really crying. Like the kind of crying that's like, <laughs> like, you know, that when you I can't I catch your breath, that type of crying. And of course he sees him and he's like, oh no, what do I do with this crying woman I love? You know, so I'm like, and he, he, he said, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Jesus forgives you. Jesus forgives you. And, and, and this came out of like the very core of my being. Cause I, I didn't think about this. I, I grabbed him by the shoulders and I said, I know Jesus forgives me, but do you forgive me? Do you forgive me? And I think he was like, yeah. And that that's one of the things that I, I talked to the priest about is I'm like, I needed to, to know That like in the confessional, I tell the guys, I'm like, I, I need to know that you for like, do you forgive me? So that's a really important thing too, at least for sure with the, the priesthood is to have priests who forgive me. Like I did something really bad. But they can totally see past that, you know, see past it. And then forgiving myself. I don't know exactly how healing works. I mean, I, sometimes I think of it plain old, like how the body heals. You know, you get a big gash open your leg and it heals. And then you're not walking bad anymore. It doesn't affect your body. You're healed, but you got a scar. The scar kind of hurts, messes things up or looks bad. It's like that. I think about my abortion and it's it's a little farther away. It doesn't debilitate my life. And I feel okay, but I carry it. But I know I'm forgiven. And at least I go back and I I love the Linda back then. She's great, you know. She just really messed up. And she's really sorry about it. But sometimes, you know, I have harder days. But for the most part, I'm okay. Self-forgiveness is, is, is a confusing topic. But I think I've forgiven myself. I think. <laughs> hey, Linda, I wanted to ask about, you know, you shared about like the nurse, the compassionate nurse at the Planned Parenthood. Um, and I assume there's good people that are trying to do the right thing. Um, do they have an outlet? Or do they have a way to kind of, I don't know, kind of like how you were able to like discern out of that? I mean, I wonder if that nurse is still there or if she was able to get right. out of it. And I assume if it was just you two, there has to be more people that volunteer, take a pay cut, do the things of Planned Parenthood. You know, like you said, Monday through Friday, yeah. needle, and then 
on the weekend, it was an abortion clinic, you know, like, do those people have an outlet? Like, what is, what's, what's that story like? Is there more people like that, that are coming out of Planned Parenthood? Are they just alone? Do they just figure it out? Like, can you share some insight on that? Yeah, thanks for that question. It was actually one, one reason why when I started to become Catholic and I was seeing a spiritual director, I remember saying, I, I kind of want to stay there because at least, at least I engage the real questions that everybody has going on without saying, you know, oh, you guys should be, I mean, I wasn't even fully pro, pro-choice then. But at least I'd be like, do you feel weird? Do you feel weird? You kind of feel conflicted. Um, now, wisely enough, that spiritual director was like, no, that's okay. That's not your your job right now. But I, I wonder that same question. And so for sure they're out there. I mean, for sure. Because nobody's wearing shirts that say like abortion is awesome. They're trying to do that. There's a movement out there to try to be like, shout your abortion you know i don't know people are a little bit like private about it right i mean condoms are cool but you know it's not that celebration of abortion so there's a sense that something's awry but i don't know the only thing i can think of is one thing that did affect me was there were people that would pray the rosary outside of Planned Parenthood. Now they weren't like, there was also a guy who had like a big bloody baby sign. who was like really mad. Like that didn't help me at all. I was just like, that guy's crazy and he's mean, you know? Like that did not help me. But the people out there praying, they were just, they were just quiet and praying and they believed in something, right? And I believed in something. And we believed in different things and that meant something to me. I also really think that it had to be all the people out there who pray, like how all of you pray, right? I mean, it had to be, it had to be grace. I mean, it had to be that got me out of there. So they are there and no, they don't have an outlet, of course, because everything in the system is there to try to keep you from asking the obvious questions. Um, but I'm absolutely sure they're there. It's just the cost is so high to leave, to ask the simple question, are we killing babies? Like everything's on the line with that simple question. And I think that's what's so hard about being pro-life is you're like, it's really pretty simple. This is not that complicated. The contraception thing might be more complicated. You know, the other issues within our faith, but this one's like pretty straightforward, you know? Um, you know, even with, with you being in, in bioethics, um, it's a pretty, it's, it's, I don't think it's a real, it can be a complicated question, but yes, they're absolutely in there and no, I doubt they do have an outlet, but thanks for asking that. Cause I, I think about that a lot. Any other questions? Um, I actually had a question. Um, so how do you think um, with Roe v. Wade being reversed and everything almost two years ago, um, obviously there's like political significance. Um, so how do you think we as ordinary people can influence politics in order to just completely ban abortion? Well, in order to have it be done legally through our legal system, right? There's a lot of, it's it's just to continue to, to it, a lot of that has to do with who you vote for, what judges do you get? I mean, it's just like how the whole American system works, right? So the way they're getting at things right now, I mean, it's interesting what just happened in Alabama with in vitro, with that whole idea, you know, slowly stepping back to like, when is something a life? Right. And you just keep pushing that through the legal system. So how we vote. A lot of it's who's in the position. It's how people interpret things. 
So you continue to show up, you continue to do your voting, you you work through the American process. The, my my concern, I mean, and you have to do that because um that will that does save lives of real people in real wombs by making it harder to to procure an abortion. The thing that has a the, the the longer game is about changing hearts, right? Because I sometimes I worry about things just flip flopping between, um, you know, Roe v. Wade is turned over, which just means that you don't, you know, states can make their own decisions. I'd like to see. I mean, I wonder. I mean, maybe some of you know. Is there research out there that shows if there's been a a decrease in in the number of abortions since Roe v. Wade was turned over? Does anybody know? Hmm. I I wonder. I wonder about that. I would think, you know, if it's just harder to get them. But I think if you're the if you're a a person who is politically minded, you continue to show up. I mean, it's it's I pro-life people like good for them. You know how long they fought for this? And then it happened, like miracle of all miracles. Roe v. Wade got turned over. That's crazy. I never ever ever thought that would happen. Ever. So in and of itself, just continuing to show up and fight the good fight. And that's what's really great about talking to people who have been in this for the long run. <laughs> I guess Roe v. Wade was turned over. That's so crazy. So continue to show up and work our system. While you were asking that question, I was just Googling and this is what I said. So a string of um, number of legal abortions in the United States increased in the year after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, but the declared uh, the, they decreased sharply in states with total ban or strict limits on the procedure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. So it, aid-wise restriction is also definitely something that's needed. That's weird that it went up for a year. Maybe it because it, it took a while to enforce it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just. I think another reason why it may have gone up is because the FDA approved other pharmaceutical, um, pharmaceuticals. So I think that could be another reason why. Yeah, that's right. That's something that we we forget. As a matter of fact, one thing. This is another, you know, not great thing for me to tell you about my past. But this is what happens: is when one of our friends thought she was pregnant everybody just takes their contraception and they they give you you give them a month's worth of your contraception and then if you if she takes a bunch of it then it forces a miscarriage and it's like the morning after pill right it's i think it works in the same way well you would know more than i do so, but um so we forget about how many unreported abortions <laughs> that there are I had a quick question. So like in your perspective, what is like the biggest influence in like the coming generation has on choosing, like if they want to like follow like pro-life or like pro-choice, like what, is it like social media? Is it like um, peers, like my friends are pro-life, pro-choice, I'm going to be pro-choice. Like what are like the facts behind people, like the younger generation choosing yeah. pro-life or pro-choice? You know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I mean, there's different strategies. Um, certainly, there's a lot of influence in social media because there's uh, access. People have access to that, access to ideas. There's also, you can um, exert a certain amount of pressure. So there, there's tactics to do it. In the end, I think... I'm not sure. But as I continue to traverse my life as a as a Catholic is that if you learn to really be able to articulate if you wrestle with the hard questions of what it means to be pro-life to take the other sides 
disagreement with you seriously and spend the time trying to honestly address those questions, the inconvenient questions, such as unwanted pregnancies, poor women. I mean, I think that that father was saying that you had somebody that runs a pregnancy center or a, right? Did you guys have another, was that what you said, father? That is somebody who runs a home for people who are, have unwanted Part pregnancies? Part of the Juliet Diocese and she runs a maternity home. A maternity home. Like that is, those ministries are the most important thing. That's where you're really putting your money where your mouth is. You're like, okay, we're supporting a woman all the way through, right? All the way through. I think another thing, another way that I would love the younger generation to think about it is there are so many women that suffer from infertility now, whether it's that it's reported more and it's just always been this way, or does it have to do with contraception? Does it have to do with something in the air? A lot of it has to do with the fact that women are older and since it's it's just the whole thing with like contraception. So men end up not getting married and then a woman is older and then she's past her pregnancy years and then a man marries a younger woman. There's all these reasons. So whether it's infertility because of health, infertility because of, you know, the age that they're at, but either way, adoption, like I, I do wonder if somebody wouldn't have come to me. So I was 24 when this happened, a big feminist really into th that whole thing. Still am in a very smart way though now. But um, I think if somebody was around, if I had any peer and they said, you wanna do something right for a woman? You wanna do the right thing for a woman? Go through with this pregnancy. I wasn't scared of the pregnancy. Go through this, this you wanna be a real superhero? Here's this woman who can't, she can't have kids. I think I would, I think if I had that kind of support, I would have done it. And therefore I think that adoption, it, to, to really support a woman through that, I think that, I, th I think that that'd be the, the way to go because we're going to have to answer the question of the, the burden. And I do mean burden that an, an unwanted pregnancy um, and having a child is, is on a woman for a man too. But you you can't you've got to figure out how to address that, and I think in maternity places, and adoption, and supporting supporting a woman if she wants to keep that child for a long time, you know, not just right away. I think that the the pro the pro life movement needs to put their money where their mouth is. So we're taken seriously. Just, just to add to that, I guess one area that the Catholic Church was maybe previously very really involved in when you go through American church history was taking care of those who are in need, meaning mainly the sick and those who are in need, right? I feel one of the biggest needs in our community right now is definitely women who are also made victims. Like when you say the child is the victim, definitely. But on the other side of the coin is also the mother who was also made a victim maybe by other pressures. So I feel that is one area uh, in the Catholic Church that we haven't focused a lot. Uh, but that's one area that we need to focus, rehabilitating, rehabilitating them, um, bringing that healing process into their minds, but also helping out if, if they are actually uh, going through a pregnancy and you need a psychological support even at that time, I guess. Oh. Yeah, I guess that's one area that the church has not contributed much in, in the past, I don't know, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that that would give a ton of credibility to things. I also have this little dream, kind of. But when I think about men in the pro-life movement, uh, I, I maybe you already heard me say this, Father, when you were at Mundelein, but I do and I don't want this, but like if every pregnant, you know, every pregnancy requires that there's a man involved, some man somewhere is involved with this. And if with every pregnancy, there was a mandatory DNA test, which is it, if it turns out you're the father, 
your wages are garnished for 18 years. Like if there was some responsibility built into it, right? Um, I just wonder if that would make men have a little bit more skin in the game. Now, I'm not really into the idea about the government knowing my DNA and all that. Like there's a part of me that's like, okay, I'm also not comfortable with this. But in terms of, you know, a lot of times the the, the pro-life discussion ends up being about women and and pregnancy but you know but like the, how did the baby get this <laughs> i mean like there's this whole other beast to it and i think focusing on that and i think in that way even the most rabid of hardcore feminists love it when men talk about other men taking responsibility right and um so in this way, it isn't all on the woman because like got there somehow takes two to tango. So I think focusing on that as as well is um, something that would would be helpful. Yeah, I know. I definitely agree. Um, the reason is because irrespective of whether um, it's going to continue with this or what, he has a responsibility for making that woman in that particular position. He mm -hmm. is culpable equally in that sense for making her go through it. And interestingly, I guess men are the ones who don't go through that uh, trauma at all. They try to just brush it off and not actually take responsibility. Responsibility is equally important. Um, if you try to put the whole blame on the woman, uh, definitely it's just one-sided and you don't see yeah. that. Right, and that, and I, I think that holding that man, if if she decides to have the child, holding that man responsible. But I think that also some women wouldn't like that because what if they don't like the guy and they don't want him having equal say over the bringing up of that child, right? So anyway, yeah. it's it's a all of this is a hard issue, but I think I think to your point, um, in terms of the future of this, it's 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 thinking out solutions to the hard issues it, it's that's the really inconvenient part but that's that's what needs to be done i have one more question mm -hmm. um which i kind of thought of when you guys were talking about like unwanted pregnancies and um what pro-choice advocates would say is um the resources or like the lack of resources there is for these children um, once they're in the world. And I know, obviously, there's a lot of different centers, um, there's adoption, foster homes. Um, but one thing I noticed after I started working is a lot of neonates who are born with like high or intensive medical needs, um, there are no like foster homes or like no one's willing to adopt those neonates. So how would you respond? I think initially when people would say that, I was like, oh, there's so many resources in the world, adoption, foster homes, but the reality is there actually isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, um... I still know that. Excuse me, excuse me. Um, uh, I need to get going, so I will actually end the recording, and then you guys can continue the discussion. I have a house blessing.